So I know that uh, maybe a lot of people do know who I am, but just in case, I wrote a book called Domain Driven Design. And Domain Driven Design is really about complex business logic. Approaching it with domain modeling is techniques that really focus on like how we use language on the project and within our code. And so maybe people are thinking now, what is the connection between that and microservices? Now that a lot of the interest in microservices does come from the scaling abilities it gives us in terms of being able to handle really large numbers of transactions and, and that sort of thing. That is not what interested me in it, although I occasionally am involved with that kind of problem. Most of the time, the problem that I'm dealing with is that the logic or the, the business itself is so complex, the problem that they're trying to work on is so complex and perhaps tangled together that it's a challenge to just make that work or make it work in a, in a sufficiently clear way that people can continue to evolve it. And that's really what domain-driven design is about. But the thing is that one of the biggest problems, and I, I would have to say, and my book is, I think, 12 years old, and I would have to say that the the number of projects that have really succeeded with this kind of approach is a little disappointing. It's not that, of course, there are a lot of them that have really gotten a lot of mileage out of it. But I see an awful lot of, of uh, failed attempts, valiant attempts that failed. And one of the most common problems is that there are not good ways to establish boundaries around parts of systems, not the kind that we really need. And so as I started to see the microservices stuff being presented, I thought, ah, now there's a real boundary. So now, a couple of years later, there, it's, it's come to a point where, I mean, I feel slight embarrassment talking about microservices because it's become such a buzzword and all. But you know, just because something becomes really popular doesn't mean that it's bad, <laughs> and in fact, you know, when you really think about the source of our expression, you know, jump on the bandwagon, I mean, you know, who, who wouldn't want to jump on a bandwagon? That's a pretty attractive thing, I think. So, <clears throat> but of course it matters too exactly what we mean by microservice. So I'm going to just briefly say what it is about microservices that interests me acknowledging that a lot of people use the word a little bit differently. And uh, so one of the most important aspects to me is the autonomy it gives to the teams and the isolation of the implementation. I would say that that is the, the part that most attracts me. I mean, we don't allow a database to be shared between microservices. And that's something that, oddly enough, I've been preaching for a long, long time, but this is the first time I saw anyone really, really do it, actually. I say, you know, I can hardly think of an exception. And suddenly it's like mainstream, so that's a cool thing. There's something about microservices, too, that acknowledges how chaotic and rough and tumble an enterprise really is, any kind of big organization, so that you know, you can have all these different, now sometimes they're talking about at the actual deployment level, you know, that uh, you're deploying these services all over uh, on many servers and some of them are going down and you're bringing them back up. But there's a corresponding uh, complexity in the actual development world where you have many teams and these teams are developing stuff that's supposed to fit together and but also it's supposed to actually work. And so I think there's a pragmatic quality to it. You know, like cattle, not pets, and all that sort of stuff. It really breaks with the past. And so I see that it's been helping people think fresh. And maybe it can help us think fresh about domain logic as well. 
But again, I say different people mean different things by microservice. So if some of the stuff that I'm saying doesn't seem to quite match what some other people are saying, you know, that's okay. I'm just talking about my particular conception of it. Now, I want to give an example here, sort of abstract example. And uh, I'm going to talk about services as just things that can consume messages and produce messages. So messages come in, messages go out, and hopefully something interesting happens in between. And so a very simple microservice application might have a couple of microservices, and they send messages and consume the messages from the other one. Now, the question that arises for me, and this has been a question that I've asked since, ever since messaging really started is, how do they understand these messages? I mean, if you just say, well, you know, I'm developing an application and I'm publishing what's happening, some events in the form of messages, and over here I'm subscribing to that and I am trying to understand those messages, they must be in some language, some schema that we both understand. And so how does that happen? Well, one way of looking at it is that um, whenever we understand language, it's because we know the context in which that language is being uttered. So that even the words I'm speaking right now are only meaningful to the extent that people you know, know the context in which I'm saying them. And the same is true within our software systems, when you receive a message from another system or if you are reading a line of code, the only way to understand what it means is to know the context. The way we usually understand the context in our normal conversations is extremely complex. And we infer context and we weave context together in a way that works great for human-to-human -human conversation, but is terrible for computer-to-computer -computer communication. So we need something much simpler. And that's what I call a bounded context, where you can actually draw, you know, metaphorically draw a line around some part of the system and say, within this part of the software, the word customer always means the same thing. And here's what it means. And you can't always do that. Sometimes software systems get into a mess, and that's no longer really true. But when you can, then you can start to make sense of what's going on. Now, domain-driven design introduces a technique called a context map, in which we try to get a big picture of a system by saying there are many of these bounded context in which a specific language is being understood. We're going to just draw them on the map. So these two services that I've drawn, A and B, would correspond to two contexts in our context map. And they have a relationship between each other, which we'll call partners, because we're going to assume that this is a collaboration that's been worked out between the two. And uh, that line also represents a translation between the two as necessary so that A can understand B and B can understand A. Because remember, these two teams are very autonomous. That means that they are not necessarily going to use the exact same terminology. If, if you and I have to use the exact same language, then our, we're certainly not autonomous in our design work. So now let's complicate matters a little bit. The messages that are being produced by A are also now being consumed by C, a new service. C did not uh, work with A to work out the, that protocol. So this is an asymmetrical relationship where C is in a follower or downstream position relative to A. And there are various kinds of relationships like that. But in a context map, well, there are a few that we use. 
So in this diagram, the arrow has an uh, the uh, line becomes an arrow, and it points toward the context where the power lies. That can be a little bit asymmetrical or extremely asymmetrical, but we just kind of simplify it. And we say that in this case, C is conforming to A. That means that when C is actually consuming these messages, that the work that they've done in their context, inside their service, is actually following that language as well. So they have given up some of their autonomy in order to make integration with the message stream from A very simple. And this is a common thing that people do when they're writing something that is using messages from a more, maybe a more uh, complex system. Let's throw another one in there. Now, D is also uh, going to consume those same messages. But D needs to do something more complex, and they do not think they can do it while conforming to C. They want to A. They want the autonomy. So they build a more complex translator. We call an anti-corruption layer. And they now can have their own language. So A has its own language. B has its own language. D has its own language. C might have in some areas, but to the extent that it is using things from A, it conforms to A's language. Now let's throw another one in there. A needs some data. And that data is being provided by this new context, uh, this new service called E. But it's being provided in terms of A's own messages. So that means that even though the data flow goes in that direction, that uh, the, the A still is the one in the driver's seat. So for example, if you were submitting tax returns electronically to the, well, to the tax authority of whatever country you're in, you're going to have to submit them in a defined format, right? There will be some very specific schema that you have to use. And this would be an example of that. Now, D also wants to consume the A messages that are being produced by E. And since D can already understand A messages, this does not actually modify the context map at all. Because the context map is, although until now, it has looked exactly like a, uh, you know, it looks exactly like the, uh, whoops, sorry. Until now, it's looked exactly like the diagram of the services, but it isn't really the same. It's mapping the relationship of those languages. And since D already knew how to interpret A, and since that's already on our map, we don't change the map. And this starts to show how certain things can be abstracted and simplified at the level of a context map. It's not just another way to draw a picture of some services sending messages. Let me add another one into the mix. This new one, F, is going to consume messages from B in that same B language that A can consume. And it's going to emit messages in F. And what they've decided to do is that F needs, perhaps needs, or at least wants, uh, the autonomy of having its own language. So they use an anti-corruption layer to transform the uh, messages coming from B into their own language. But then uh, C conforms to them. Now, you, you'd say, well, you can't conform to more than one context. That's true if they are sending you the same sort of information. If, if I were getting customer data from F and customer data from A, I couldn't conform to them both. But if I'm getting customer data from F and and uh, vendor data from A, then I can conform to both. They're two different ways of, two different sort of uh, categories of information. So on it goes. Now, one point I want to make is that in any system, there are multiple models. Not just that I think there should be, although I do, but that there are. And, uh, 
if nothing else, you have your legacy system, you have your new system. You have the external systems that you've had to integrate with. But usually, multiple teams will develop multiple models. And so microservices kind of embraces this with that team autonomy. And the alternatives to having multiple models are not good things. They actually undermine the goal of modeling. See, I think that because people have gotten so into trying to create a single model for a big scope of a software system, because they've focused on the issues of integration through a schema or something, they've lost sight of the power that a model can give you to actually solve logic problems. But a good model doesn't need to be big. It needs to be very clear. Those are actually kind of pulling at each other in opposite directions. You want things extremely crisply defined. And to do that, to define something very clearly, you need to be explicit about context. So another thing that tends to make models powerful is that they can make assertions. I can say that um, there are no customers who are uh, that there are no customers who have never ordered anything. I could make an assertion like that. Is that assertion true of all software systems? Of course not. It might be true of some part of my software system. And if I have bounded context, I can say yes or no. Is that statement true about a particular context? So this is, again, why we need boundaries in order to do good domain modeling and to actually get any benefit from it. And I think that the lack of those boundaries, as I was saying earlier, is one of the things that undermines us so often as we try to accomplish that. And that's why to have a more practical, more um, a way that seems to actually be working to create boundaries is something that uh, I value. Of course, a another thing that happens is that things start to go wrong. That is, I don't mean in the usual sense that microservices will you know, go down and have to be brought back. I mean that the design will start to go wrong. So as people are, are um, refining and changing their design, sometimes they make mistakes. I mean, sometimes they couple things together or they, you know, all the usual design mistakes. So let's say this has happened in F. The people who wrote, the team that wrote the F microservice have made some fatal mistakes. This might be the same people or it might be different people who have taken it over and didn't really understand the intent of the design and started tangling things together in a different way. One way or another, this is very common. And what happens in a monolithic system is that this kind of corruption just metastasizes throughout. But when you have boundaries, what happens when you have a uh, when you have some part of the system become well, as we sometimes call it, a big ball of mud. So, or maybe it's a small ball of mud if it's a microservice. But at any rate. Well, one thing that happens is that C becomes a ball of mud. Because C conforms to F. And if you're conforming to a mess, then you become a mess. So that's inevitable. But it doesn't spread any further than that. So we've contained the mess. Now, uh, E. Here's a trickier one. E has started to create a mess. And the particular thing that's affecting, that's making this worrisome is that, remember, they were conforming to A. They were emitting messages which were in the language of A, very tightly conforming. And now they are tainted. They're kind of, well, they're like A messages, but not quite. So I'm calling them AE messages. And this happens all the time. Now what's going to happen next? 
Well, first of all, this context map no longer describes the situation. It says that B is conforming to A, but it's not. So we need to do something about that. We need to make the map realistic, because realism in a map helps us to make strategy and figure out what to do. I'm just going to put some warning markers on those, saying that there's some risk of corruption around these particular relationships. Now I had to put a connection between E and D because I don't understand anymore what's going on exactly. And then, what can be done about this? What are we gonna do to try to, you know, get back on track with this? Well, one thing before I talk about that, I wanna make the point that not all of a large system will be well designed. And one of the reasons I think that we have so few well-designed systems is that we don't really, really accept this. And we try to make everything well-designed. We don't really do triage. And so we spread our energies too thin. So thin that you can barely see the effect of the design effort sometimes. So I'm going to be quite prepared to, you know, say, well, maybe this part doesn't matter so much. And in this particular case, we're not going to try to fix E. Now, you could try to fix E, and that would certainly be nice. But suppose we can't do that. Well, one way to mitigate the effect of this is to put an anti-corruption layer in front of A and D. Now, notice that it's basically shifted the power direction. This is the people in A and D saying, hey, we've got to protect ourselves from the mess that the E people have made. They're no longer conforming to us, and we are going to pragmatically build a little piece of software in front of whatever was processing those messages that transforms the things we were getting into what we actually need. Now we're protected. There could be other ways. A and D could both share the same transformer or something. Of course, it's always possible you could fix E. But we can't make saving A and D dependent on fixing E. A, at least, we know A is this very central kind of system. So let's not let idealism get in the way of you know, keeping a system that's still basically in pretty good shape. So at this point, I think that I've gotten across, I hope that I've gotten across, that, the, uh, that microservices, as they're usually described, as I, what I'm hearing anyway in the description, make good context boundaries. And often people say, you know, one team owns it. They have a lot of autonomy about how they design it, and so on. And um, this allows us to have that specialized model that solves the problem that that microservice is supposed to solve. Of course, lots of microservices do relatively simple things, and they're being broken off for reasons of performance. And that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about a microservice that's doing some fairly rich behavioral thing. Another thing is that by having these sort of breakers in there, we can keep design mistakes from just spreading through the whole system. OK. Now, what about, though, and this is one of those things which I think people have started to talk about more. As you get a whole lot of microservices, you know, a lot of the interesting stuff is happening between the services and not within the services. So what about that part? How does the design of that come into it? And here's where I think that we can look at this and start to see a bit of a problem. Because look at all those A messages. Look how many different uh, contexts are conforming to A or have translators to A. And basically, what's happened is 
that the language of A, the language that they developed for their own internal logic, remember the original motivation for that was for the logic that they were creating, but then they published some messages that said this is what's going on inside, or these are the results of the transactions we've done, or whatever. It's become a de facto language that is used between the different uh, contexts. In fact, in one case, between uh, e and D, it's even being used between two contexts that aren't even currently talking to A. This happens all the time. Of course, in, in uh, terms of natural languages, you know, uh, you have, I don't know, a Chinese person and a German talking to each other, and they probably speak English. And it works, I suppose, but the trouble with this here is that it's, it's going to have an effect on A. First of all, this language won't be optimal for the purposes of E and D talking to each other. But secondly, and more importantly, now that all those different uses of their languages are in place, they can't change it. That obviously doesn't apply in natural languages where people do whatever they want, but A, can't change their language anymore. Because if they did, it would break everything. So I think that recognizing these interchange languages is important. And maybe creating explicitly an interchange context. So suppose instead, or maybe at a later stage when we recognize that A is emerging as an interchange context, and we say, well, let's make an explicit interchange context identify what is it that makes that language so important to so many different contexts. It isn't everything in A. A lot of what's in A is very specific to their needs. So we could devise a new language, probably simpler and easier to integrate with than A. And we can use it. And so now when A, so now if you look at the arrows up top, they've been changed to be little I's instead of A's. And what that means is that E and D and C and A are all interacting through that interchange context. This is not a physical thing in the system. They're still, these messages are still being published and subscribed to in just the same way as before. The only difference is what, how is the content of the message defined? at what is the semantics of it. And um, notice that A probably is still producing its little A messages, and they're going through that new anti-corruption layer to be turned into I messages so that other people can consume them. But C likes to conform, so they just change things to conform to I instead of A, and so on. Now, this might be quite a difficult change to make in a, you know, in a system that has a lot of interconnections like this. We might get halfway there. We might say, well, A will publish both A's and I's, because the I's will come out of that translator. And then uh, C will continue to consume the A's, at least for the time being, because it's too hard to change it. But D is going to change. So they've got an anti-corruption layer. It's pretty easy for them to change. And E is uh, going to change because uh, they need to uh, do that. Well, now an interchange context, I think, is something which sometimes emerges on its own, but would work a lot better if people were more conscious about it. And it's a good way, as I was talking, it's a good way of kind of giving you a language for some of the commonly exchanged data. But it also is a good way, a good place to work out protocols of interaction between services, which is something that uh, some people talk about and I think should be talked about more, is that an awful lot of what's interesting is happening at that level. And so, and, and we should be applying our design tools there and not treating that as a technical integration level. So 
this allows us to tune a language to that purpose. And it might be two different purposes, by the way. So just to be clear, at this level, when we have terminology, we're expressing it in terms of you know, messages, uh, service interfaces. So whereas when we're inside of one of those, we might be talking about objects or functions, programming language constructs. It's very different in its uh, physical manifestations. But, but the same principle applies that we're trying to have a clearly defined language, or a language with very clearly defined terms that's expressed very explicitly in whatever constructs that we're making. So I, uh, you know, so when some context emerges in a dominant way, like A did, and becomes the de facto common language between a lot of, a lot of contexts, well, we can prevent that from sort of strangling their ability to change if we can make a shift to, a, uh, to an interchange context. And as we get a whole lot of services, another sort of interchange context can allow us a place to actually reason about how they interact in the same elegant way that we do. And that uh, with, with in a context. And that uh, brings me to Make, uh, saying very explicitly, I think that, you know, I'm not talking about a single interchange context. This is not the replacement of the enterprise model. It's, it's bigger than us. I mean, it's outside of services and will be in that space where they interact. But it isn't like we have to have one of them. Obviously, you would start with one. And so the interchange context is going to be a logical boundary. At this point, microservices does give us a really nice, explicit, and, and concrete uh, boundary around the logic that one team is creating within a particular service. But it doesn't uh, really do much for us in terms of the service-to-service -service, uh, conversation. So we will have to fall back on kind of, you know, more documentation kind of ways of keeping track. But while on that subject, I'll bring up that uh, a lot of the people that I know that are, you know, say, yeah, uh, you know, domain modeling is important and I see that we have to have boundaries and they agree with me on all these things, but they don't like the idea that you would use a microservice with this intent. And they'd say, well, it's a lot of overhead, which I'd agree, it is quite a bit of overhead, you know, if all I wanted was logical partitioning. So why do I find that so compelling? And I'll tell you the simple reason. Because we have been trying it the other way for as long as I've been in this business, an embarrassing long time, and it just hasn't worked. The logical partitioning, it isn't robust. If there isn't something in the system, you know, that people can see, then it just doesn't hold up. It doesn't tolerate the chaos of a real development project where people get in a hurry. It's too prone to attempting to unify everything, you know. It, it, uh, if you have a monolithic implementation, then monolithic modeling feels very natural. And it almost always slides in that direction. The, the boundaries aren't very clear, so someone in a hurry just reaches and grabs something they need from over there and uses it as is. That's not so easy in microservices, right? It's not so easy to just say, oh, well, I need that piece of data, and it's right there in that other database, so there, I got it. Well, you know, that's easy to stop in a microservices environment, but not so much in a monolithic system with logical boundaries. So I think, you know, we got to just uh, sometimes just accept things that come from experience, and one thing that seems to come from experience is that the other approaches we've taken 
are just too subtle. They just don't usually hold up. I'm, of course, talking about the sort of most projects. There are always exceptions, and I've been on some of them, where we managed to make the bounded context work pretty well without a really physical boundary. Now, as I said, the uh, interchange context won't have a really explicit physical boundary, so you have to describe it in some other way. And uh, so you're back to the to the old way on that. All right, well, just to kind of wrap up, my real motivation in all of these things is always that I, um, I want to do an elegant design aimed at some really tricky business problem. That's what really turns me on, to take on a problem that is so convoluted that everyone thinks it's going to always be a mess, and then we tease it apart, and we have an elegant and subtle model, and the problem just kind of just goes away, right? Just becomes, seems to become simple. That's great. I love to do that. It hardly ever, it, it so often goes wrong, because that kind of model is very fragile. And so it takes a real boundary to make that work. It also takes acceptance that not everything in a system is going to be like that. And uh, in fact, to even embrace that and say, why would we apply those techniques to something straightforward? So I love the environment that a microservice can, in principle, create for that kind of work, though it doesn't automatically happen. And then the other thing is the proliferation of services brings back some of the same old problems. Once you have hundreds of microservices talking to each other in all sorts of ways, you can easily create, you know, spaghetti of a different, just a different level of spaghetti code. And uh, I'm sure this has happened already. So this is where the context maps and the, uh, come in to start to say, look, this is what's happening. Here's a picture of how these different rela languages relate to each other. You know, maybe these people should be conforming rather than creating yet another language. And then use of interchange context. I say modest use of interchange context because this is the sort of thing that people can get a little carried away with. Uh, but still, using these things to create coherent sets of microservices that actually know how to talk to each other. But without saying at the same time that everything that the services do inside themselves has to follow the same uh, language or logic. So that's pretty much it. One last, not all of us, large system will be well designed. And then I'm ready to, uh, to, uh, to basically close and take a few questions, I think. Have you actually seen any example of a company or a team or a set of teams where this has been applied to microservices and actually work? Uh, could you say, have I seen a team or a company where this has been applied to microservices and actually work? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a couple. I, I think that uh, now the most interesting ones, by the way, have, uh, that I've been involved in personally have not been wholesale adoption of microservices across the board. They still have their monolith or monoliths and uh, multiliths. Anyway, they still have them. But as they're trying to migrate away from this legacy, you know, there is the old way, which is basically let's create another monolithic application that will take responsibilities away from the legacy system. And instead of that, uh, what, what I, I'm seeing in some places is to spawn a much, you know, initially like just one little microservice that takes away one 
well, or that parallels one important business responsibility that, and, and chosen because this one is one where the business really wants to innovate. You know, so they don't want to be uh, constrained by the way it was done in the legacy. And yet, in the legacy, because there are so many dependencies and so on being monolithic, uh, they just can't make the changes they want. So they create a, uh, another system, but a small one. And then another one. And then another one. And once you have a few of these, now that was done in a kind of a, I saw that, uh, I've seen that for at least five years, done in a kind of, you know, ad hoc way. But since the microservices thing has emerged, the people who are doing that use the microservices architectures, and, and it works much better. It's, it's cleaner, you know. Uh, they have a pattern to follow. And so, yeah, it, I think that's, that's how I've mostly seen it, because everywhere that I work, there's a huge legacy. Uh, you know, I, I haven't been involved in many places where they're sort of starting from scratch. So it's usually like that. But it's really been helpful in those places. Next question over here. Yeah, so <clears throat> if I remember correctly, uh, if two contexts have uh, part of the domain that they share, you call it a kernel, is that correct? The shared kernel, yeah. yeah. So do you have any thoughts on that with regards to microservices? Because, yeah. So I, have be, I was a bit, I've always been a bit skeptical of the shared kernel in terms of I think it's one where you wouldn't want to use it too often. And I, I think my skepticism has just steadily increased over the years. And if I were using microservices, I wouldn't do it. So. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, regarding back to the, I mean, whatever you call it, the kernel or mm -hmm. that uh, context that emerged, um, uh, just to, to give, I mean, uh, um, the interchange context, does it have to confirm to one of the original contexts? In your example, does, does I have to confirm to A's terminologies? No. Okay, so that's a good point. If, if you went through the story that I just mm -hmm. described, mm -hmm. chances are it is going to look a lot like the right, A. Right. Because everyone's used to that and so people tend to follow that pattern. Ideally, mm -hmm. you would look at the problem fresh and say, the problem of, of these four or five, uh, of course the numbers in your real one might be a bit larger than my example, right? So it might be more than four or five. Mm -hmm. the, the problem of the uh, interactions of mm -hmm. this set of services is distinct from the problems being addressed inside the services. Right. And so let's look at that problem and think what kind of messages would we really want to have if we were just talking about you know, that problem they're trying to solve. And so often it would be, you'll find for example, there's a lot of stuff in the messages that come out of a specific service that are first of all, made it just be more detailed than anyone else cares about. And secondly, are, are expressed in a way very much around the problem that they're trying to solve there. Uh, and so, yeah, I would ideally like to see it be a bit distinct. So in this case, that's my next, next question. Uh, don't we need, in that case, an uh, anti-corruption layer between the context themselves, themse between A, B, C, and D, and right. I, on the other hand. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and uh, let me just go back to that last picture since, and you see there are, uh, each one that uses the interchange context either conforms to it or has an anti-corruption layer. So each, the, the particular choice each one has made is declared explicitly. So if you say, well, you know what, whenever I talk about these things, because the thing I'm doing maybe I don't need any really specialized domain model to do my business logic. I'm just kind of bringing some stuff together and consolidating it or whatever. Then I'll just conform. But A obviously can't conform because it predates I anyway. You know, they'd have to transform everything they do. It just, and, it, and anyway, A has a model that, that was designed to solve some complex business problem, not just to use to talk to someone. And D likewise, but C and E have, have decided to just conform. To conform, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. As usual, provocative 
Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Provocative. Well, that's good. No, I, th I think that's a good word, though, because it is a bit of a different, you know, it's a different take. Yeah. Any other? Oh. So in, in my experience, uh, trying to convert messages, there's still only so much you can do. I mean, if, if a field is optional in one system, it's really hard to make it required in another system. So, so, I mean, the first system that gets built sort of like defines how the data model looks and of course you can make small changes. But I mean, if, if it looks like, so I've been doing, f for instance, financial systems and the way the data structures looks in the mainframe, it's just really hard to not sort of looks very similar to that in, in all the other systems as well. So it is true that the way things usually go, if you start with, like in this case, A, and you carry it as far as it went here, that you're going to end up with an interchange language that looks a lot like A. Even then, it might be valuable, because let's suppose that we've reached the point where A is having a hard time continuing to evolve. They can't change things as freely as they would like, because they have you know, their own language is the basis of the interchange of a whole bunch of stuff. So even having an eye that's just kind of a cleaned up version of A would still be an advantage, I think. But another thing that could have happened is you might have recognized it earlier. You know, yeah, sure, while it's just A and B talking to each other, this is superfluous. And, and when it was just C consuming a few A messages, it would be overkill. But when you see another one start to join the bandwagon and you start to say, oh, you know, maybe there's, this might be place for it. Another thing is that I think that I was talking about the protocols of interaction and, you know, there's some larger goal here, right? Or a few larger goals. That is, it's not just, well, A does some business things and uh, C does some business things and so on. There's some kind of interaction here that is getting a bigger business process done. And we might say, I want to be able to be explicit about how that's done. I want to be able to model that and show how the different services talk to each other to accomplish it. And so that would be, I think, a very powerful motivation to create a interchange context between a specific set of services that are in that are key constituents of a of a of a whole business process, you know. And and that's one thing I think is sometimes hard to see. In very decoupled systems, it's hard to see how the how the whole thing fits together uh, without having some kind of rigid top down uh, orchestration. So that would be another reason that I would perhaps choose to do it relatively early before it's become so entrenched. The story I told, I partly told it just to illustrate how these, these interchange languages, they do emerge on their own, just in a non-ideal way. You are gonna have these, you know, everyone's gonna just kind of start using A. Because it's just, that's how it works, it makes sense. But, um, and I'm saying let's do that maybe a little more consciously. So that's one thing. But there's the other thing of the, you know, to try to have a, a really explicit approach to the protocol of interaction between some finite set of services that we've defined. Does that make sense? Oh, okay, there's one more. And uh, I guess that'll be all the time. So one more. It'd be hard. Yeah, if you talk loud, I'll bet I... I'll just speak loud. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, okay. So to repeat the question, just because you didn't have the microphone, uh, would I, so there's sort of two things I've been talking about, one being the protocol of interaction, but one being this easier way of exchanging data that a lot of different contexts need to use. Would I start out with a kind of canonical model? Uh, Tower of Babel was the, was the phrase you used, and, and then uh, that way, early on, a, um, a new service that wanted to send messages would send it in this form. And I would actually probably not want to do that because it seems to me to be too much on the slippery slope to the, to the enterprise model, to saying there will be one model for all of these things, and because it uh, does too much upfront decision making. At the very beginning, I don't really know what messages these services want to send to each other. That kind of is emerging you know, as, they, as they're built. And once I see what kind of messages A and B and C and D are all sending to each other, then I can look at that and I can say, ah, I, can, I think I can now devise a nice, somewhat clean, not perfectly clean, but somewhat clean uh, schema that will be good for conveying this set of messages between these particular services. But if I started out at the beginning, I would end up with something that didn't quite fit. And, um, you know, and I don't even know, like, since I don't intend to use just one interchange language for everything, I intend to use it for sets of services that, are, that talk to each other a lot, for example. Because there really are like little clusters of coherent services, you know. And uh, so I think, yeah, I think I would avoid that, but be on the lookout for these clusters emerging and saying, rather than wait until we have the de facto ones so firmly in place that we're not going to be able to get free of it. Let's then try to come up with something nice and clean, free of so many of the things that they were using just to get their little problem solved. And it does look a bit like canonical models and such, but it, it's not the same thing. It's another model used for a specific purpose. We're not using it internally. Yes, yeah, C decided to use it internally. They conformed. But that was a compromise they made. It isn't being imposed in any way. Uh, and people doing complex things, I would encourage not to use it. So, well, I see that I'm out of time, uh, minus two minutes. So, uh, well, thank you for your time and uh, your attention. And I guess the conference is basically over, but uh, maybe I'll see some of you outside.